Let's go ahead and uh, open your prayer. If you'll pray. Dear Father, we thank you again for this time to come together. Thank you for the class that we can look to your words and learn more about being the leaders of the home. And we pray that as we study your word, we understand it, we know how to apply it to our lives. Guide us through the study, help us as we strive to be the best Christian men that we can be. Thank you most especially for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Excuse me. So the last few weeks, we've been discussing relationships. You know, first, our relationship with God, because obviously all other relationships should be founded upon God and our relationship with Him. Last week, we discussed, in my opinion, the second greatest relationship we have, which is a relationship with our wives. As Christian men, we need to be a man and lead our wives as God has called us to. We are to love them as Christ loved his church. We need to respect them to gain their respect and be kind and understanding and show them honor. And finally, we need to submit to them as a sister in Christ. But today, we're going to be focusing on ourselves. This lesson is entitled The Balanced Life. So when you hear the word balance or balanced, what comes to mind? What do you think of when you hear balance? Equality. Equality. A lot of it has to do with time management. Okay. Or priority. So we're thinking of balanced life. What about just balance? You see someone that is balancing or has balance? What, what ideas come to mind there? Consistency. Consistency is great. Harmony. I'm sorry, what? Harmony. Harmony, okay, yeah. We got, we can definitely be talking about those things. What else? What do you think about a tightrope walker? Do they not have that balance? I mean, they're on one little line with this huge long stick to help them balance, right? How about those guys spinning plates on a stick? Tremendous balance, right? You know, this is becoming harder and harder for me to do, able to stand without falling over. That's balance. And as I get older and older, it gets harder and harder. So what things can be unbalanced? Give me some, some types of things that can be unbalanced. It's my category. <laughs> my diet is not balanced as it should be. Budget. Finance. Yeah, exactly. Bank account, budget, finances, all that goes together, right? How about your tires? Tires get out of balance, don't they? You know, people also can be unbalanced or have problems with balance, you know, especially if they have inner ear issues, vertigo. That's a uh, I've dealt with that one time, and then it's not fun. Can't even stand up without the world spinning. So when these things are out of balance, what does it look like? Whether it's meals, tires, whatever. What does it look like when things are out of balance? Wallets. And wallets, yeah. And the local may destroy the evidence. That's exactly right. It destroys the item. What else? Tired will create another problem somewhere else. Okay. Or can create more it's other problems. You bet. You bet. You know, if, you, if your diet's out of balance, you look like me. If your tires are out of balance, they start wearing, and then other tires start wearing. Uh, bank accounts get out of balance, you can get in some real trouble. If, uh, chaos. Chaos, <laughs> exactly. It, it can lead to chaos, absolutely. But how do we fix that problem of being unbalanced, things being unbalanced? What are some remedies? Could identify it to begin with. 
Very good, yeah. I yeah, know there's a problem to fix the problem. What else? You need to know where the center point is. You need to find the center point. If you don't know where the center point is, you can't get it back in balance. Um, you know, the tires have that special machine they put on there to, to balance them. Uh, you know, I met with a dietitian because I work at a clinic now and you get all these free benefits and so she gives me this balanced plate of what you should eat, you know. You got to know what, what the right thing is in order to get it back into alignment. So balance has different meaning in various areas. <clears throat> For instance, in sailing, sailing, balance is not talking about the boat being balanced, it's talking about staying on course without adjustment to the rudder. You're in balance, you're going straight without any adjustments. Music. You have the various sources of blending of uh, volume and voices and or tones. Music has balance. Art, balance means the harmony of design and proportion. In physics, an a, a balance is an apparatus for weighing, especially one with a central pivot and a pair of scales on the end. Clock making, a balance is a regulating device in a mecha mechanical clock or watch. And of course in finance, the balance is representing the difference between debits and credits in an account or the amount of money you actually have held in an account. So the general definition of balance is an even distribution of weight enabling someone or something to remain upright and steady. A condition in which different elements are equal or in the correct proportions. Mental steadiness or emotional stability. Habit of calm behavior and judgment. <clears throat> Found this interesting, interesting though. Google definition of, a ba of balanced living. Balanced living is considering all aspects of your life. Relationships, work fitness and health, and emotional well-being. What is left out of that definition, though? Spiritual. Your spiritual life, your spiritual well-being. <coughs> Many people strive to balance worship and service to God, work, family, relationships, leisure, and health and fitness. These aspects should not be evenly distributed, however. God should take up more of the place. The other aspects are of little value if you fail to be overbalanced in the areas of worship and service. It is here that we continue to grow and deepen our faith and find our value within the body of Christ. So none of these other areas will get us to heaven. But putting too much emphasis on these other areas can keep us out of heaven. So we are weighed in God's balances. Daniel 9, or 5.27, Daniel 5.27. Daniel, you have been weighed in the balances at Mount Mormon. So as we see here, this is the part of the story of Belshazzar, who, if you remember, was, saw the handwriting on the wall, and this is one of the words that was written. And it's talking about how we are balanced. We are balanced, uh, weighed in God's balances. And Belshazzar was found wanting. So on the day of judgment, we do not want to be found wanting or lacking. If you remember, why did Belshazzar lose his kingdom in his life? You remember the story? He took over the kingdom, if you will, or assumed leadership, but that's right. He was not balancing his leisure time, in this case, the drunken parties, with managing and leading the king. And so, because of that, it was taken away from him. <clears throat> How can we be assured that we will not be found like by living a balanced life in God. Not a balanced life according to Google, according to the world, but a balanced life in God. 
So let's let's find out how to do that. Someone read Mark 12:30. You have had that. Mark 12:30. Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and all your strength. So living a balanced life looks like the first and greatest command. To love the Lord your God with your heart and soul and all of your heart and soul and mind. So start with the heart. Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Colossians 3. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and, a, and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with thankness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So this section of Scripture talks about the heart. It talks about our emotional being, the heart. It's all that we feel. We see throughout these verses compassion, patience, forgiveness, thankfulness, and most importantly it says love. So all these emotional feelings need to, again, express our love for Christ and for God. Also our soul. Our soul, of course, is our spiritual being. It is my soul that sets me apart from every other living thing. God put eternity in our heart, not to any other creature on this earth. <clears throat> this is how I am in His image, because we have that eternity we have with that soul. All of our spiritual being means my pursuit of godliness. Talk about the mind. Uh, let's read Philippians 4 8. Philippians 4 8, a few pages back. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is, is admired. Whatever is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. So we need to think about such things. We need to put it in our mind. Our mind is our, our mental being. We need to have that knowledge and growth and study by using these type of things and meditating on them. And then our physical being, the strength. That's our work. That's our service. That's our physical bodies using them for the service of the Lord. So, if you recall, what did Colossians 3.14 tell us that binds everything together in perfect harmony? Love. Love, is, love ties everything together. It is interwoven throughout our emotional, spiritual, mental, and physical beings. Let's read 1 Corinthians 13, 1-3. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries of knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. So these verses tell us that I am nothing. Or I gain nothing without love. No matter what I'm doing. Even if it's a great benefit to the world around us, to our brothers and sisters, if I'm not doing it out of love, it profits me nothing. So 
love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. However, we do not need to be like Anna, if you remember Anna in the New Testament, who did not depart from the temple, but worshipped, fasted, and prayed there day and night for several decades. She had lost her husband early on in life, and as, as uh, opposed to remarrying, she dedicated the rest of her life in service to the temple. Admirably, but that is not what we are called to do. God knows we have other responsibilities in our lives, to which we must attend. Attend. But attendance does not equal faithfulness. The old saying goes, a cat in the oven does not make a biscuit. However, there is a correlation between attendance and what is important, and that is Bible study. Am I engaged or just showing up because it is commanded? Some are folk forsaken the assembly while sitting in the pew. Credit that to Lee Hogan. Don't let that be you. Also, busyness does not equal spirituality. Being busy does not measure my growth, though it is better to serve out of fear and grow into a mature Christian who does serve because we understand the debt that was paid for us. Turn with me to Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. Be careful how you walk, not as otherwise be as this wise. Make the most of your time because the day is evil. So this tells us that we are to make the most of our time. We do need to be in attendance. And we do need to be busy with the Lord's work. But we need to do that by making the most of our time and out of the right motives. So what does your plate look like? Many of us have work, we have relationships, family, our leisure recreation time, you know, health and fitness. Some enjoy doing that. Obviously we need our rest time. Some still have school that they're trying to get through or, or gaining additional uh, knowledge through their job. So let's talk about each one of these work. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work heartily. Ask for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. All right. So work for the Lord. That is how we are to do all our jobs. Any job that we're working on. We may have a, 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 a boss who is not pleasant to work for. But we need to work for the Lord, not for him. Another verse regarding work, 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. <clears throat> but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many uh, senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through the cravings that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many plums. So this talks about our motive for work. Is our motive strictly to make more money? talks about the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil and it's caused people to fall away. I think we all know people who put more emphasis on work than their Christian faith. And that's what we cannot do. Uh, let's talk about relationships. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Second Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked <coughs> with unbelievers, for what partnership has the righteous, righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So this is geared more, I think, toward the unmarried at this point in time. I'm talking about being unequally yoked with an unbeliever. That 
is basically wisdom. You, uh, you want to find someone that has the same beliefs and, and faith that you have. Um, and in most cases, we want to find someone that has a deeper faith that we can. That way, they will help us, and we can certainly strive to help them as well. That was the gist of my fireside devo. Talking about exactly. how my friends didn't want to, didn't understand how I want to spend more time with these people I just met than my old friends, and I like them more. I thought, no, that's just where I need to be. And I wish weird. you were there with me. That's right. That's kind of where I think our leisure time, we can be spending our time with people. I mean, I, you can still do the things leisurely or for entertainment purposes or things to have just fun in the balance of life and not spend your time with people that are that are going to lead you away from absolutely. I mean there's there is not I'm not saying you never involve yourself with them because you need to be shining light within life, but you have to be careful of that relationship because it can take you away from it. Yeah. Going and playing <coughs> basketball with a bunch of teenagers and helping them learn how to grow and be Christians might not be as fun as going golfing with my adult friends. Who's better? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can still be an influence on them without, you know, spending all that time with them on a golf course. You know, that's a three-hour trip. Um, you know, if your focus is, uh, specifically, if your focus is on the golf and not trying to build a better relationship, then maybe that's not the best use of your time, too. So, you're right. right. That idea of, man, I need some me time. Just imagine yeah. Jesus saying, really? Really? You need yeah. some me time? But you do. Oh, yeah. Oh, Lord, yeah. And we're getting ready to get that there. Now has preached that sermon two or three times here. It's called the mountaintop time. That was that was prayer. And, and we we need that mid time. We need to best. We need to disengage. That's and prayer and reflection, and, though, right? And Are you? Yes, but there's many ways to do that. Okay. You, I think you have to disconnect from from the world periodically, or else you'll be overwhelmed with it. Okay. I just grew up around a lot of men whose me time was very selfish. Well, you got a big hand. Uh, hunting and fishing and things That's like that. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I would guess Mark could tell us that when he fishes, he does it probably more than most of us in here. That's a good reflection time. It's disconnect. You you kind of take a moment, and probably during that time, you may spend some time in prayer. You might spend some time just thinking. But, uh, but are you are you going fishing? Are you going to the golf course? Are you doing that every Saturday when you can spend some of those with and, your and his mom family, family and your Christian day? Yeah, well, don't you think this is perfect. perfect. My, my point, right. my point is, if you spend your whole every waking moment running all of these other areas and you don't take a moment for yourself, I promise you, you will crash. You'll get burned out. Well, or, or there will be similar to the balance company you said before. It's a temporary, the long-term residual effect of that is, is marriage problems, it's parent problems, it's, it, there's, there's other things that spin off from that lack of balance. So you, you want the personal rebuilding and recharge time. It's not selfish in, in that way, in that use. I can tell you. There, there, and I don't want to eat up your class time, but there's an exercise, as you know, Susie and I taught marriage classes for many years. There's an exercise that we taught and we still do every year that if you'll give me about three minutes, I'll walk you through what it is. Oh, yeah, you got and, and I'll let you do it. I'll do it, from, minutes, so. I'll, I'll do it from here. Draw a big X across that board. And then draw a straight line from top to bottom right through the center. Someone said. Close enough, better than mine could have been. And right in the middle, draw a zero. And then on the end of each of those, put a 10. You don't have to do this all the way through there, but I'd encourage every man in this room to sit down with your spouse, do it individually, and then sit down and reflect on it. Between the zero and 10, you're just gonna mark one, one through 10. So it's just a, it's a scale from, from zero to 10. Anything like that? Yep. And we refer to this as the wheel of life. And, and if you take each one of those spokes, you might put something different in there, but obviously one of them is your spiritual walk. The next one, maybe it's your, yeah, your so relationship. Like you're having each one? Yep. 
So the next one maybe is your relationship with your spouse, your family, just your relationship with your family. The next one would be, you can put them in whatever order, but finances, vocation, or career, job, however you want to. Uh, the uh, uh, personal, just that inner time, that mountain time, that time to reflect and help. And then honestly go through from zero to ten, zero being non-existent, ten being as perfect as it could be. And rank yourself, where am I spiritually? And that, that's everything from your walk, your talk, your study time, your prayer life, and whatever. Let, let's just say somebody said they were five, so draw a line. Just right. Yep. And, and then their relationship with their wife from zero to ten. Relationship with their right. And so you, you do all, just just I'm not gonna ask you to rank yours, but just put some lines at different places where you think you are financially, where you right. think you are with your career. We are with just your personal, that self-image, that me time. That was definitely one. Uh, and help. And then, and then connect those with a circle like you're drawing a wheel. Okay. Connect the dots. Don't have that on the mountain. Stop that around. Now, <laughs> if, if, those, if you had four of those on your car, what would your ride through life be? Now that, you would be rocking all over the place. So, what we realize is, as wonderful as you have your career, things like your, in this one, I mean, this is not you, this right. is your, your health, for example, is, is pitiful in that, right? Yeah. So what we know is each one of these will ultimately affect the other. If your health is down and you become sick and you can't do your job, Ultimately, it's going to affect your career, which in turn will affect your finances. It's a good, strong chance that will ultimately affect your family. Obviously, personally, it's affected you. And over time, that's going to affect your spiritual life. That take any of them. If my finances is off, it probably is going to affect my, my family life eventually. It does affect my health because of the stress involved with that. Mm -hmm. And it's going to affect my career because I'm not going to perform as well as I ought to. And that, too, ultimately affects my spiritual life. You take any of those... If they're out of whack, if they're out of balance, it will ultimately affect the other ones. Right. So you have to be honest about like where you're at and begin to inflate that tire over time. Yeah. And, and as you look at each of those, then you can dig deeper. What, what do I need to do to make my health a five? It's not going to go from one to ten or make it a two or make it a three. And, and as you as individually and as a couple begin to inflate that tire, what will end up happening is your health will improve. You'll probably perform better on your career. Odds are it'll probably be more positive on your finances. Yeah. No doubt it'll be more effective in spiritually and in so each one of those, just as the negative can, can ultimately tear up and destroy the whole vehicle yeah. as we inflate that tire. And, and it's an exercise we do every year. That's great. And it just help helps us. Is our is our tire nice and round? Absolutely not. But it's but it's more round, if you will, than it would be if we don't if we don't address it's it. It's probably more round than when you first started doing this exercise. Absolutely, because you recognize, you identify, and that's part of what we talk about. When something is out of balance, you got to know that it's out of balance, and that's a great exercise. And, and you can you can be a ten spiritually. Don't know what all that means to each of us, but you. I mean, in theory, if you were truly a ten spirit, so you're not neglecting your family or anything else right. in your career. But, but kind of to your point, you can you can kid, kid yourself say, "Well, look at all the things I do. I'm involved. I'm in the building seven days a week." Really? Well, what about your family? Are they being affected by that? So, so again, spiritually, is I think we would all agree, spirit, true spiritual, we're, we're going to be inflated, but. But we can fool ourselves in, into what what doing the Lord's work is and, and, and working. And we're going to get to this point later on, but you know, obviously, spiritual affects each and every one of those. It needs to be a part of each and every one of those. It's, it's not just a small spoke. It's, you know, this is probably talking more your spiritual service and not 
like you're saying, being at the building seven days a week to neglect everything else, because that's not true spirituality, because you are required to take care of your family, take care of your, your finances. I can take care of my health and my personal and my career and my finances, but I'm taking care of them. It's not we are taking care of them. It's I'm taking care of them. So my spiritual and family is at zero. Because yeah. I'm busy man. Right. I'm doing things. And if it's I'm not a success. Movie. If it's not Exactly. Movie. Yeah, yeah. So I think that, that was just my comment. Is like when I say me time, I mean more of like the... Uh, when you feel like you need to get away from your family or you need a hobby or something like that, uh, I believe in spiritual reflection and, and everything that Jesus did, but I also know that he exhausted himself working with others, and that's why he had to have it. Yes, he did. And it was because he was working with him. Come on. Y'all are ahead of me, but that's all right. <laughs> good, good, good comments. Uh, let's go to the next one, family. Uh, Matthew 10, 37. Anyone who loves his father and mother more than he loves me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So this is talking about the priority of family in relation to God or Jesus. And, and so we need to realize that there still is a hierarchy there. Our families are second to Christ and God and Spirit. Um, leisure recreation time. First Timothy six seventeen through nineteen. First Timothy six seventeen through nineteen. Man, those who are rich in the present age do not be haughty, nor to trust in certain riches, but in living in God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So this verse tells us that God gives us those things to enjoy, but we have to do so in the proper manner. We can't set our hopes on the riches, but enjoy what we do have, looking forward to that eternal home. It's a hard thing again, right? Sure. The love of money. Yeah. Right. right. So you, you could love money for those for the idea of giving it to the church, helping those in need, giving away, you know, being being able to be generous. That's that's a heart issue. Yeah. But that verse, as we know, is talking about that's that's becomes our first love. That's right. And so it's yeah, there's a balance there. Absolutely, as well. Uh, health and fitness. First Timothy four eight. Back to page probably. Here's Timothy 4 8. For body discipline is only a little part. The God of this is part of for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So, ESV version says the bodily training is sort of some value. So, yours says little profit. So, there is value in training your body. God is not discounting that. But what he's saying is it's more important. To look to your eternal body and, and your eternal home. And, and so we don't need to focus so much on that health and fitness. Also, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 6. Nineteen or, or do you not know that your body is a temple or the Holy Spirit within? Whom you have from God. You are not your own. For you were bought with Christ. So glorify God with your body. So our physical body is there to glorify God. It is the temple of God. And we need to treat it as such. And we need to work on our health and fitness because of that. And then we have rest or me time, as we talked about already. Matthew 11, 28, 29. Come with me, all of you that labor, and when you labor, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And uh, learn from me. For I am gentle and lonely at heart. Lonely at heart, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So here we can see 
how we can get that me time. How we can rest is, is lay our burdens on Jesus, not take them on ourselves. We can spend our me time meditating and praying and laying our, our concerns before Christ. Uh, also, Mark 1.35. Rising very early in the morning, it was still dark. He departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. So we see here that me time Jesus, Jesus took. Real early. He did it real early, which, knowing by example, maybe we need to think about that. But uh, uh, we do see the example that Jesus took at me time and, and prayed. You know, we see other examples where he did it really late, you know, right before he walked on the water to meet them in the middle of the sea, he spent some time in prayer to God. So most people are probably like our family. Our me time is her watching TV and wondering me. <laughs> That's not good me time. That is not good me time. That's right. That's right. So spend that time in meditation and prayer. Um, as we talked about earlier, think about those things that are pure, holy, that whole list. Um, school, you know, yes, an education is important. It's going to help us provide for our families. It doesn't come close in importance compared to our Bible education, our spiritual education. You know, at Thanksgiving, we all want a bigger plate. At least I do. We want a bigger plate at Thanksgiving. But sometimes we live like we want a bigger plate. When we really need to be putting smaller portions of some things on our plate or leaving them off altogether. We need a big helping of God in His family first. And that talk, that's talking about our worship, our service, fellowshipping with our fellow Christian brothers and sisters, uh, being in Bible class, our own personal study or evangelism with one-on-one uh, -on -one evangelism with someone else. It's talking about our benevolence or generosity. So how can we balance all the needs of this life and make sure God gets the largest portion of our time? I'm okay. struggling to do this, but when I do it, I always am glad I did. Um, it's keeping keeping yourself kind of ready and prepared to do Bible study whenever, wherever you are. Uh, we had a, you know, coming off vacation, we had a broken washing machine and a tall yard we got home to. So a lot to do. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to go look for a washing machine. So I went and found a washing machine. Can't deliver till Friday. I said, okay, so I'm going to the laundry. And uh, I just said, well, I'll grab my Bible. Rather than sitting on my phone, I'll, I'll do a little Bible study while I'm waiting on the laundry. And uh, it was real beneficial. It actually prepared me for something I have to do next week because it just so happened where I was in my study was dealing with um, finances and how we should be responsible with our money and that our charity is a big deal. And uh, that's something that I'm going to campaign for at work is to get a lecture of maternity leave for um, one of our girls that's pregnant. I was like, you know, this is a this is a good way to build me up, and, and it really helped me out. It also put me in a situation where if someone saw me study my Bible and wanted to study with me, they could have maybe asked me. Uh, that's just something I don't do as much, but man, just keeping it keeping it on me. Keep it, I mean, if I can if I can keep up with the thunder, I can keep up with the Bible. And I keep up with the thunder. Right. So um, little things like that, I think. They still have a team. They still have a team. <laughs> For me, it's always been a trying to submit to God over my own ego or my own opinion or my own thought. Like, I have a lot of things. I, I, my way is, I can tell you how to do it. But it might not necessarily be the right heart or mindset or Christ-like or fit into the balance of what it needs to. So I think that before you, as you go through and how you find it, or how you just, just consult the source first, and, and submit to that first. Whether sometimes you'll have freedom to make your own decisions, but most of the time, either by by concept or by direct writing in word, you'll be able to go to scripture. Okay, I, I have some range or leeway to make a decision, but but it, at least I have some guidance in in that, and not try and just be my stubborn hard-headedness and do it my way. And I, 
I'm not this work. <laughs> I've not had bad results when I do that. <laughs> but when I when I make my own decision, I don't consult the source. And then I, if it's a me decision, sometimes they've been my bad ones. Sometimes they've been expensive ones. Sometimes they've been, you know, not the best choice of, of uh, to, right. that I would be proud of. Yeah, I had a whole list of uh, practical things to do, but uh, we don't have time to cover all of that. So, you know, I'll, I'll go down here to God knows the demands for our time. The soul of Satan. Mm -hmm. And he wants us to believe the matters of the world are more pressing and more important and more urgent than matters of spirituality. You know, God expects us to work, but that must not define us. <clears throat> we are to care for our families and cultivate relationships, but that must not be all-consuming of our time and thoughts. God knows we need time to recharge, as we talked about already. Enjoy His creation, keep ourselves healthy and fit, so that we can keep on serving Him. But the greatest amount of our time and money should not be spent on these activities either. Now, God gave us a mind, and it is a good thing to keep on learning. It is not to take the place of our continuing spiritual education to keep on growing in His knowledge. So we need to be honest with ourselves. We need to look in the mirror. Do the secular activities in your life take precedence over spiritual ones? Are they on equal footing? If so, then I suggest that, you, that your life is unbalanced in a dangerous way. If you are unbalanced, then take the steps to fix it. You know, take out or limit the activities that are eating up precious time that you could be spending teaching your children or anyone else and growing yourself. Our lives should be unbalanced in the sense that <clears throat> our plate has more godly and spiritual activities on it than secular. We should find ourselves saying, no, I don't have time for that in my schedule because I have worship to go to, Bible class, or a Bible study to Bible or church activities that may be coming up. So, I have to skip that question too. <laughs> Standing our ground when the world is trying to push our spirituality into only a small section on our plate is important because it teaches our children about commitment to God and His commands. So we need to stand our ground when it comes to the spiritual things in our lives. If we truly want to hear those wonderful words in your end, you will be a servant. And we must be a servant. Not a Christian when it's convenient or it doesn't interfere with something I'd rather do. I love the, uh, you know, the Devo song, as it's called, Make Me a Servant. Lord, make me like you, for you are a servant. Make me one too. Make me a servant, do what you must do to make me a servant. Lord, make me like you. So it's time to be unbalanced and really love God with all our hearts, souls, mind, and strength each and every day until we draw our last breath. Be unbalanced. Be God's servant. So that's our lesson this morning. Think about those practical ways that we can strive to be unbalanced in the proper manner and the fact that all of these folks, as we talked about earlier, we need to include Christ in them. We need to include God. And if we have that balance of God in all of those, that tire will be wonderfully round at a perfect ten, hopefully. So and we have a God that loves us and is honest with us and truthful. He told us that being his servant is not a yoke that we can't carry. It's an equally balanced yoke. So if we're doing these things, we're trying to do them when we feel unbalanced and stressed. We might want to look at it, are we doing it our way or are we doing it his? Because if we were doing it his way, we'd be well balanced. Right? Absolutely. Any final comments? It gives us a reference point. Matthew 6, 33 is a place to start. Seek first. It doesn't mean we can throw all our marbles in one bag. But that's where we start. That's where you can, you know, you, you've got to identify your problems or your areas like up here where you need to work. Where, where do I need to start? Where do I need to be at? Or what's, what's my help? Maybe it's not a 10 spiritually. Because if we're 10 spiritually, like Jim said, we should have some balance all the way around. All those should be, we should excel. That's what Matthew 6.33 says. We start there, 
Those babies will fall in line. Now, it doesn't, doesn't mean they will automatically do that. Right. We have to make the effort. That's where we start.